Hello, this is Bill Morgan, president of Parker University, and today I have with me Dr. Carlo Amendolia. Carlo, can you tell us a little bit about yourself? Sure. Uh, I'm uh, trained as a chiropractor, but then I went back to do my master's and in, uh, in my PhD at the University of Toronto, and now I'm a professor at the University of Toronto and also work at Mount Sinai Hospital, where we combine teaching, clinical practice, and, and research, primarily in the area of degenerative mechanical uh, back problems, particularly with a particular interest in spinal stenosis. Good. The, um, your stenosis is what brought you to Parker University today to, to talk about your protocols. And, I've, and I go back to the Kirkcaldy-Willis study in 1985 mm -hmm. and, and, and showing the value of chiropractic for treating uh, scoliosis back then. And I have a real strong interest in that. So what are the breakthroughs? What's special about your protocol that we should all know as chiropractors? Well, I think what's uh, unique is the fact that it tries to address all the issues that are impacting people's ability to walk. These patients have spinal stenosis, their dominant limitation is walking ability. And so it's a really big focus on improving function and a little bit less on trying to get el eliminate their pain. Uh, the other uniqueness about the program is it, it really looks at the multitude of issues that are impacting their health and that's from the physical, the functional, and the psychosocial. So uh, we direct the, our treatment very systematically and very, in a very structured way to deal with those multitude of issues that are impacting their ability to walk primarily. And as they improve their walking, they also reduce their pain and their quality of life. So the, the, the focus is function, uh, but we address the multitude of issues that are impacting uh, their condition, and that's what's so unique about it. And it's very structured, and uh, structured from the point of view of the patient, but also structured from the point of the clinician. So any, at each visit, there are certain goals and objectives that need to be met. Uh, if we're going to address the multitude of issues, then we have to do it in a very systematic way, and the program uh, is designed to do it that way. Awesome. And, you know, chiropractors were really in love with x-ray. With I, I personally, I love x-ray, I love MRI. So I look at stenosis, I see a disc bulge, facet hypertrophy, infolding of the ligament of flavum, and we work on these patients, and we re-image them, and the patient's better, but all those things right. are still there. What's going on? Well, we don't uh, really promote imaging uh, because uh, neurogenic claudication, which is a clinical syndrome caused by spinal stenosis, is a clinical diagnosis. You don't need imaging. Uh, so we train our trainees and even our medical trainees, because we have medical trainees that train in our clinic, uh, that imaging plays a very small role in dealing with these patients and they only in the sense that you have to rule out red flags if they have sinister problems like cancer, infections, and fractures. Mm -hmm. But beyond that, the imaging is, is not very diagnostic because 30% uh, of patients over the age of 55 have moderate stenosis and no symptoms. Mm -hmm. And so we have to be careful how we interpret it. And it's also not prognostic. So severe stenosis doesn't mean this person's gonna be a wheelchair, it doesn't mean they're not gonna get better with surgery, they're not gonna get better with, with our program. So it's not prognostic, it's not diagnostic. It's only useful for the surgeon who's ready to operate um, mm -hmm. And we don't even recommend it for, for, for epidural injections because epidural injections don't work for, for neurogenic claudication to response stenosis. I'm glad to hear that. I feel, you know, my understanding of, of, of uh, epidural injections, they've been way overused for almost everything. The, the, the evidence is not real strong. A quarter, a quarter of all epidural injections performed in the USA is for spinal stenosis, and the evidence supporting it is nil. There's no support. Ironic. And it's, at best, it shows it gives temporary relief. It does not prevent surgery. In fact, it may complicate surgery by, by causing atrophy of the dura um, and make more complicated surgeries. Absolutely. But the also thing is that when you're dealing with claudication, claudication is a neurovascular problem. It's a lack of blood flow to the spinal mm. nerves. The spinal nerves are becoming uh, choked because they're not getting mm. blood flow. And so epidural injections are for inflammation, to reduce inflammation. But this is not an inflammatory process. It's a, it's a neurovascular process. So that's why from a pathophysiological perspective, epidural injections don't make any sense. Uh, because these patients get immediate relief by bending forward or sitting down. Mm -hmm. The inflammation, there's no inflammation that changes that quickly. But from a vascular perspective, where you're getting blood flow and then no blood flow, and then that quick change around would suggest it's a neurovascular problem. And so epidural injections are 
the, and there's lots of systematic reviews and clinical trials. Now the most recent ones published in the New England Journal of Medicine last year that showed that epidural injections are not useful for patients with neurogenic claudication due to spinal stenosis. Preaching to the choir here. Now you say these these patients are usually better when they sit down or bend over. Mm -hmm. So what happens is we get that infolding of the ligament flavum, which straightens out mm -hmm. and it reduces some of the, the, the stenosis. Yeah. So what happens uh, from a pathophysiological perspective in patients with stenosis is that when patients stand and when patients walk, the size of the canals get even smaller. And what happens then is that we have this venous plexus within the spinal canal, and the venous plexus its job is to take deoxygenated blood back to the heart, just like every other part of our body. But within the canal, what happens is because of the narrowing of the canals, that blood can't get to the heart, so they get engorgement of the venous plexus. Mm -hmm. And the venous plexus starts to engorge with blood, and that causes a blockage of the cerebral spinal fluid around the cauda equina. So now we've got a backup of the cerebral spinal fluid, we've got a backup of the, of the uh, venous congestion, and that decreases blood flow to the capillaries that the supply the blood flow to the spinal nerves, and the numbness, the tingling, the weakness, and the pain in the legs is coming from from this kind of lack of blood flow or the hypoxia or the ischemia to, the, to those nerves. And so when you bend forward, the decongestion goes away, the blood flow goes back to the heart, and it goes back to the nerve, the nerves got that, got that blood flow and now got that oxygen and the symptoms go away. And that's what patients sit all day. So, so for these patients who we want to get them doing aerobic exercises, you're having them doing recumbent bicycles, right. stair machines, Absolutely. things that they're flexed at the yep. spine. And also what we're trying to do is to, to, to teach patients how to go into what we call the pelvic tilt position, and that's reducing the lordosis of the lumbar spine, because the lordosis is arch, and arch closes the hole. But if you can flatten the lordosis, and that will increase the size of the canal, which means it, get, it decreases the size of the canal, which in, decreases the congestion, which improves blood flow. And it's been demonstrated over and over again using standing MRIs, but by changing the lordosis, you change the size of the canal. So we knowing that, we actually, with the manipulation, the, the soft tissue work through, do the stretching, we're facilitating that, that intersegmental flexion, then patients hopefully can do it on their own, standing and walking, and that will improve their walking. And our clinical trials demonstrated that these patients improve their walking tremendously, not only in the short term, but for the long term, because they're learning to do this mm. for the rest of their lives. So you've got, you've got a protocol yep. based on flexion. Yep. Um, I, I do a lot. Of, I've, done, I've done a lot of lecturing on disc, which mm -hmm. a lot of times we work on extension. But it's I, the opposite. It's the opposite. And I've got some great imagery of, of ligament and flavum hypertrophy, facet hypertrophy, and disc bulges, and showing how it really opens up up the, those the, the canal. Yeah. I've got a, some great images from um, Wolfgang Roshny mm -hmm. he, with his cryotome showing extension this certainly makes that canal more narrow. Absolutely. So how do you tell the difference between seeing something like neuro, you have neurogenic claudication, what about um, you know, peripheral vascular disease or peripheral neuropathy? How do you tell the difference between those yeah, two? Yeah, so that's a great question. So the way you tell the difference is that in patients who have vascular claudication, uh, there's no partial uh, changes to the symptomatology, meaning if we get this patient who has vascular claudication walk and then you ask them to stoop forward, it's not going to change their symptoms. Or you get them on a stationary bike, it's not going to change it because the blood's still required for that action. So, so patients who have vascular claudication, there's no dynamic nature to the symptomatology. They go uphill, downhill, using a bike, bending forward, doesn't change. Neurogenic, it does change. And that's because here you have a change in the size of the canal impacting blood flow to the spinal nerves. And so you can really discern with a very keen clinician asking the right questions, you can often discern between vascular versus neurogenic by identifying that partial nature. But unfortunately, Dr. Morgan, in 25 to 30% of cases of neurogenic claudication, you also have, have concomitant vascular. You've got these things happening at the same time. Yeah, comorbid conditions. Comorbid conditions yeah. are really tough. And so sometimes you can sort of tease it out. Sometimes because two things are happening at the same time, it's hard to tease out. But those are the kinds of things you've got to be thinking about, at least understanding the pathophysiology. Well, you, you spent the day at Parker University. We spend eight years becoming doctors for Absolutely. a reason. That's right. Because when you oversimplify the problem, yeah, it becomes it's dangerous. Yeah. Yes, there's there's always a simple solution that makes all the sense in the world. That's that's common sense shows it's this way, and it's wrong. Right. Complex problems require complex solutions. Right. And also, Absolutely. you have to put it on your thinking cap. Absolutely. Um, now, I, 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 I went back to the Kirkcaldy Willis study. Mm -hmm. it's, a, it's an old one, but it's a classic study. I believe they showed that we have about half the, half the folks with stenosis, and about half of those, we have long lasting relief. Mm -hmm. What's, what do your studies show? Our study shows that uh, patients who have spinal stenosis, 85% of them who are on the boot camp program, show at least 30% improvement in their walking ability. And uh, that in itself is, is important, but what's even more important that 
83% of those patients maintain their benefit at 12 months. So, so, and and you're, you're teaching them how to, how to live their life. Exactly. So part of uh, our program is really dealing about changing behaviors and changing attitudes about their condition and giving them self-management strategies to maintain their, to manage their condition for the rest of their lives. So 85% uh, of our patients are at least 30% approved, 83% are at least 50% uh, approved at week eight. And then at uh, 12 months later, 83% of patients are at least 30% improved and 74% or at least 50% improved at 12 months, which tells us there is behavioral change occurring. Patients are now learning how to manage this condition on their own by exercising on a, uh, on a daily basis, by doing the right exercises, by doing the right things in terms of lifestyle modifications, all the things that are gonna maintain their benefit. And what we found when we, when we, when we uh, surveyed the patients at 12 months, 60% of our patients were telling us they were they were uh, doing all or most of the exercises um, on a daily basis. So we've got behavioral change occurring because these patients are continuing to do the things that they learned early on because the program was for eight for six weeks and then they're on their own. But then we kept following to see how well they were doing and they were maintaining their benefits. And that's what we should be striving for all our patients, not just short-term gain, but long-term. With these chronic conditions, it's the long-term benefit that we should be looking for and it's behavioral change mm -hmm. and teaching patients how to self-manage is the key for long-term benefit. Long, it's, we're going for the long game. Also, as you said, it's the, there's stenosis in most of us over 50, and we're living longer. Exactly. And the boomers are moving into the, the stage where Absolutely. they're all going to be getting stenosis. So right. this is something that chiropractors certainly should be putting a lot of time and emphasis into. 80 million. 80, 80, million, 80 million Americans will be over the age of 65 in the next 15 years, and the research, the Framingham study suggests between 20 and 30 percent of those patients will have neurogenic claudication. That's a big number. If you want your practice filled, learn to treat those. Now, with it, you've got a boot camp. Do hmm? you have an adjusting protocol? That yes, you we do. Okay. Yep. High, vo high velocity, low velocity, what are you doing? We, do it, well, we tailor to the individual patient, depending on the frailty of the patient, depending on the, on the, on the patient's uh, kind of health status. But the goal is to improve intersegmental flexion. So we do a combination mm -hmm. of things. You do manipulation to sort of gap the vertebra, because ultimately the patient has to learn how to go into the pelvic tilt to increase the size of the canal. Those vertebra have to be mobile enough. Those muscles have to be elastic enough to be able to go into that. These patients are older. They have stiff spines. They're not going to be able to get moving to those vertebra unless you help them along with a little bit of manipulation, a little bit of adjustments, a little bit of mobilization. It's a combination of all that. You really got to be sort of using your clinical judgment and how much force. Yes, we use low velocity, high, high speed manipulation, but not on everybody. Some of it's just mobilization, but it's, it's not trying to be specific to one vertebra. It's trying to mobilize the entire spine to get that mobility to reduce the lordosis when they're standing and walking. Well, do you have any closing remarks you'd like to share with us before we, before we close this out? Sure. It's been a big pleasure for me. This is the first time I've been in Texas and first time I've been in Parker, and I was been just, just so impressed of your institution here, Dr. Morgan, and, uh, and I've just been happy to be a part of today's day, and uh, hopefully I was able to impart some knowledge to the students today, and it's been my pleasure to be here. Hey, Carlo, thank you so much for coming. We look forward to working with you in the future, and, and thank you so much for coming to Texas. Oh, it was my pleasure. Look forward to further collaboration in the future. Awesome.